When Keir Starmer stood to be Labour leader, he promised he would bring integrity to the party. However, the key to having integrity is practising what you preach. And when it comes to employment practices, Labour is doing the precise opposite. All year, Keir Starmer has loudly opposed the practice of firing and rehiring workers. He was right to do this. It's obviously a terrible practice. It's a way that bosses can replace their workers with who, who have high rights with workers who have lower rights. It might be the same worker. Often you say, we're going we're to fire you on your current contract and then rehire you on a new contract, or it can be different people. Now, let's look at some examples of Keir Starmer calling out these practices. In April, when British gas work workers were being threatened with fire and rehire, Keir Starmer said, the whole Labour movement stands in solidarity with British gas workers. They're defending themselves against the shameful practice of fire and rehire. British gas must abandon this practice and the government must outlaw it. Later that month, he tweeted, as I said at the TUC last year, fire and rehire is wrong and it should be illegal. That's why I'm supporting Unite the Union's campaign to outlaw fire and rehire. And in May this year, in response to a story about Argos, he tweeted, threatening to sack staff unless they agree to worse pay terms and conditions is appalling. Fire and rehire must be outlawed. Those are all very good tweets, the kind of tweets you should see from a Labour leader. However, Due to more recent events, they leave Starmer now vulnerable to charges of hypocrisy. That's because Labour has just fired a third of its permanent employees, while at the same time advertising for new workers on insecure contracts. John Snow in The Independent writes that despite the scale of the layoffs, the party is actually recruiting temporary staff on significantly less secure conditions than those being asked to take redundancy. An advert post on a recruitment website offers potential workers a six-month contract and says work is to be done from home. All applicants need their own laptop, a secure Wi-Fi connection at home, and must bring their satisfactory firewall and virus protection. The advert does not mention that the job is working with Labour and falsely claims that it is in the public sector, but the Independent has confirmed with the party that recruits will be put to work in its governance and legal unit, which investigates claimants against members. Um, I should say this is by John Stone, not John Snow. The new recruits are being offered a decent wage. They're being offered £19 an hour, but a six-month contract does mean they'll have fewer rights than the people Labour are laying off, the many people Labour are laying off. Defending the decision, a Labour source told The Independent, this is unrelated to the announcement about the voluntary severance scheme. It was agreed by the NEC several weeks ago as a necessary and temporary measure to help us clear the backlog of complaints as quickly as possible. Referring to the redundancy scheme, they said, this is not an easy decision and we recognise it will be a very difficult time for staff. We will fully engage and consult with them and the trade unions throughout. We are reshaping our party's operation with a view towards being fighting fit for upcoming campaigns and the next general election. Ash, what do you make of this? Do you think the charge of hypocrisy is warranted here? I mean, I think it's worse than hypocrisy. I think it's venal. I think it's callous. I think it's cruel. And I think it shows that the Labour Party is neither serious politically under the leadership of Keir Starmer, but also in terms of the management of its own internal bureaucracy. It's simply not fit for purpose. And what is the one thing Keir Starmer promised uh, when he became Labour leader? It was competence. These are not the actions of a competent leader, and it's certainly not the actions of a competent General Secretary, uh, David Evans. So if there's one person who needs to be fired and indeed not rehired is David Evans, because this is a crisis of his and Keir Starmer's making. Um, they alienated lots of left-wing Corbyn supporting members, so their membership dropped significantly, and it meant they had less money coming in. And despite the promises of the likes of Peter Mandelson, those big money donors never returned. You also had the unions uh, becoming a lot more circumspect about making uh, payments to the Labour Party. So you do have uh, an internal cash flow problem. Instead of that being made the responsibility of the senior members of staff and the leadership who took the decisions which got the party in that state, it's now, you know, the case, well, 
you know, as in the kind of institutions and organizations that Labour would normally criticize, that the books are being balanced on the backs of some of the most precarious and vulnerable workers. And you look at where the firing and rehiring is going on in terms of uh, the government's and compliance unit, you think about, well, what's clearly a priority here? When you've got a third of permanent staff being made redundant, you've got an expansion in the governance and compliance unit, which means that Kisama is going, you know, while we've got um, you know, our hands on the tiller of the leadership, what we've got to do is crank up the purging operation of left wing members or people who, you know, would be unlikely uh, to vote for a centrist or a right wing candidate if there is another leadership election. So I think that tells you a lot about uh, the priorities of this particular Labour leadership. I think it's venal, I think it's self serving, and I think it's deeply hypocritical. Mm. And obviously, you know, their defence is we needed this particular task to be done, which is looking through this backlog of complaints. Now, you, you might think that if if a, if a leadership of an organisation wanted to, you know, look after its workers, it might say, OK, we're going to redeploy you. There are some people in one department they are going to redeploy them um, to be in the complaints department. I assume the reason they didn't do that, why they don't want to do that is because they they don't necessarily think these employees are aligned with them politically. So they want to get people who will just follow all of their orders and basically purge who they want to purge. And I assume they didn't have confidence that many of the staffers hired um, under five years of Jeremy Corbyn would do that. Now, from things such as the labor leaks, you'll know that Jeremy Corbyn and his team were far less successful at ridding um, Labour HQ of people who were ideologically opposed to them. You could look at this and say, well, good for Keir Starmer. He's been incredibly ruthless. Jeremy Corbyn wasn't. But what did you see when Jeremy Corbyn tried to do things that were just one tenth of this? There would be media outrage. You'd have the MPs on all of the radio shows saying he's a Stalinist. Now this happens under Keir Starmer, so they just get rid of a third of the staff all in one go, and no one's calling him a Stalinist, no one's saying anything about it, they just say it's completely unremarkable because Keir Starmer does it, whereas when Jeremy Corbyn did it, it would be an outrage, and that's why they you know, kept a load of people on for years, even when they were actively um, trying to undermine the party's chances. Back to the issue of workers' rights. It was an awkward day for this news to drop for the Labour Party. That's because Angela Rayner was launching Labour's New Deal for Working People. Here she is talking to the BBC. People in Britain shouldn't have to go to work and really struggle to feed their families and support themselves in very low-paid, insecure work. So today it's about making sure that everybody gets rights from day one in employment, can have the right for flexible working, not just for the employer, but for the employees as well, who have done so much, you know, adapting and working from home over this period, and making sure that everybody has a minimum of at least £10 an hour real living wage. And I think that will really boost our economy, but also give people some security and respect in work. And we think that's the absolute minimum that people should expect. So Raina tweeted out that clip from the BBC. She wrote, today we are launching our new deal for working people to make our economy work for working people. Flexible working for all, living wage of at least £10 an hour, job security and rights from day one on the job, not insecure contracts. At £19 an hour, Labour have met one of those conditions. Um, presumably also these jobs are going to be fairly flexible. You can do them from home. Job security and rights from day one on the job. Now, if this is a six-month fixed-term contract and they've just got rid of a load of people who had permanent contracts, it seems to me that this move by the Labour Party has created a net loss in job security. Does, does Can a six-month contract count as job security? Well, it seems like they gave four jobs to Angela Rayner and sacked everybody else. I mean, that doesn't seem like a great distribution uh, of contracts. But like joking aside, what they've done is exactly the same thing that they would rightly criticize any other business or institution or organization for. You get rid of a swathe of the workforce who are on better paid, uh, you know, more secure contracts where they've got rights and more than that because they've got those rights and they're secure in their jobs it means that they will feel confident to do things like be part of a unionized workforce or 
really basic stuff like take a sick day or um, you know a time off to look after their mental health. Um, whereas when you replace that secure workforce with an insecure workforce, you know on temporary contracts and they're worried about you know getting their next contract, they're hoping that they'll get one in the same workplace so they don't have to jump around from place to place. Those are exactly the kind of workforce uh, workers who don't unionize. Exactly the kind of workers who don't take sick days when they deserve them and ultimately suffer a lot more stress and anxiety because of that insecurity. So I don't think it's serious for Angela Rayner to be going around, you know, advocating a set of policies, which yes, I do agree with. And I think that some of them are really good policies. When when you take one look at her own party and they're doing absolutely all of the things that they would castigate a business for doing. And I mean, they'll say, oh, we're not a business. We're a political party. We've got all of these financial problems, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I remember... Uh, years when you had MPs who were all on 70 grand a month who talked about workers' rights if you talked about mandatory deselection. So, <laughs> so that they, they, they saw democracy as an affront to their workers' rights. Now an MP, you know, isn't isn't a worker. No one, no one's their boss. Um they're you know they're elected, that's stating the obvious. But they don't they don't have workers' rights in the same way that everyone else has because they're not employed you know, by, by anyone. They are the boss of their of their office. But you had all of these Labour right MPs who said, how dare you? We're supposed to be the party of workers' rights and you're trying to implement local democracy. That means we might get replaced by someone else. Why not somebody think of, of Neil Coyle? Neil exactly. Coyle, leader of the precarious workers' brigade. I mean... And, and, and I'll bet that, you know, very few of the third, one third of Labour's staff members who have been made redundant were on 71 grand, right? The, these are much lower paid workers than the Labour MPs <laughs> who went on all of the national radio stations to say, oh, how dare these bullying members even consider replacing us with someone more aligned to their politics, right? It's you, the, the hypocrisy is is impossible to ignore, unless I mean, you're the mainstream media who are who, who just love ignoring it. And this was, this was something which I said when Corbyn was leader, and I say it now that he's not leader as well, which is that the Labour Party is a toxic workplace. It really, really is. Some of the stories that I've heard coming out of, uh, you know, the leader's office as well as um, MPs' offices and then also Southside, which is the Labour Party HQ, would absolutely... Uh, horrify you. I'm talking people behaving in ways which are so egregious that you would think that they wouldn't be tolerated in any normal workplace. And the reason why such bad behavior is able to uh, flourish within the Labour Party is because, you know, people come under, you know, factional protection. So there are political interests in keeping people in certain positions, even if they treat their colleagues or people who work under them like absolute trash. And I'm talking about stories I've heard about sexual harassment, about, you know, workplace bullying, um, about people who have been made to work, uh, you know, doing jobs within their role, which aren't part of their actual role and are really demeaning and awful. And I'd like to say that, oh, it's only the Labour right who've done this. No, this was something which was actually a non-factional phenomenon. But because everyone is so concerned with looking after their own little empire, there are just horrible behaviours which have been normalised and, you know, effectively co-signed within the Labour Party. It is a toxic workplace. Like, I would never ever work there in a million years because I value my own mental health too much.